Yes, loud yeah. and clear. Okay. Hi, yeah. Stephanie. Hi, good morning. Um, well, at least for, for us. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you hear me all right? Yeah, you both came in, you're both coming in really nicely. All right, wonderful. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a little quick overview. This is our third session of the day on gap years. And there was a little bit of selfishness in holding this ses these sessions because I'm particularly interested in gap years, but they've really not come up a lot in our conference. So as an incentive for all the tech work that's kept me long, long days preparing for the conference, I get to hold these discussions. So we've had two previous sessions and uh, we've had students largely, I think, commenting on gap years. And we've had uh, two uh, women from organization, organization that helps students take gap years. I think the common threads have been concern about uh, getting off track. Uh, the, the fellow from the UK said about 1% of their students do it. My guess is in the US, it's maybe even lower than that. Uh, but the concern would be that you lose financial aid, you have trouble getting back into college. The counter arguments that have come up have been pretty consistently this idea that you, you kind of take charge of your own life or there's the potential to take charge of your own life in a gap year. And because of that, things change and your ideas change and maybe, maybe your higher education is a much better experience. There was some concern that, that uh, someone said, I might go on a gap year and not decide to keep going back to school and that makes me scared. And so we talked about kind of, well, if you at that point in your life made that decision, it would probably be the right decision. And mm -hmm. it, you know, might seem scary now, but maybe there's a reason that you would do something else other than school. Um, we've talked about the difficulty of parents letting go. We've talked about very real dangers that can take place. We've talked about the way in which the age at which we consider people to be adults has really sort of significantly moved forward. We're moved to an older age. And I asked the question that really prompted a lot of discussion. Uh, what percentage of US high school students did people think graduate as competent adults. Hmm. And that uh, provoked a response almost identical to the one you just gave Ethan from just about everybody, <laughs> which is it's a question that makes you pause and say, well, why is that number so low? And, and, and the thread, maybe a little bit of the thread has been that schools as a, as a device for kind of creating conformity and, and followership and training for the workforce Maybe they don't really produce the kind of independent thinking that we like to think they do. And so um, maybe a gap year is a way for those who are, who are starting to kind of develop their own sense of agency to really do that. Oh, and one final thought. Uh, that gap years can produce hardship and that some of those hard things are actually the most valuable ones later in retrospect. And so it's a willingness to voluntarily go into a hard circumstance. Okay, so with that intro, uh, any of you who want to are welcome to turn your video. Um, you do that down at the left, bottom left, and just click on the, the video icon. And then Veronica or Stephanie, did either of you make a short presentation? I know that Ethan has one. Uh, yeah, I have a short one as well. Okay, awesome. So. Uh, Ethan, let's start with you and then we'll go to Stephanie and Veronica. If you've got something, let us know. Otherwise, we'll then, then go to conversation. Great. No, that sounds good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quickly. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> we are. The gap year. There mm -hmm. it is. Great. It's always a funny question. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because it's um, such a subjective perspective. But um, um, Steve, you, you made a, a, a great request to keep these concise. So I'm going to try and fly through these so that we can get to the more interesting level of discussion here. But just because I feel like there's there's so often some some misunderstanding around what a gap year is. I think one of the common pushbacks I get is, well, well, gosh, if I work at Dairy Queen, and I always harp on Dairy Queen because um, um, their blizzards are my Achilles heel, but, but if I just work at Dairy Queen for a year, does that count as a gap year? And, and I, I would call it a great working year. I would call it a great experience. I wouldn't necessarily call it a gap year. And so um, um, 
just for those that are listening and not maybe sort of necessarily reading along, um, at the Gap Year Association, we decided to uh, sort of title a gap year as a, a semester of, uh, sorry, a semester of experiential after. learning, typically taken after high school and prior to career or post-secondary education in order to deepen one's practical, professional, and personal awareness. Now, quite specifically what that means is, is we like to codify that as a minimum of two months on experience because two months is the minimum amount of time that you can really have some sort of lift your head and get your bearings for the future kind of perspective experience, as well as having it be focused on experiential education. I think part of what we're trying to do is interrupt the overwhelming academic in the classroom, butts in a seat kind of learning and expose students to another way to engage in the world. And for many, the, the gap year is really their first foray into uh, uh, sort of experiential learning. Um, but I've always struggled with how to, how to describe the gap. How do you define it in terms that, that can be sort of fairly simply understood? Because it's a hard thing to define because in, in some ways it's more like, like our idea is to take you and make you a better version. Okay, so what's the program for that, right? There's no sort of universal program you know, towards self-authorship. It, it's just something that we stumble upon it's, it's a bit haphazard at times, it's experiential, it's a little bit messy, and hopefully if we're doing our jobs well, we're, we're cobbling it all together into one sort of uniform direction or, or, or sense of self or purpose for the youth. And so um, um, I like to simply break it down into four different elements. And, and I, I like to say it could be as, as few of two of these, or more properly, ideally all four of them, but one is some amount of service or volunteering. And I like to see that that's important for, for helping sort of collaborate in the sense that, that sort of Empathy is an important human trait right now. Um, um, when something bad happens across the globe, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice and pithy thought to say, oh, well, that's, that sucks for them. But the reality is that that's going to come back to, to, to get us too. And at some point, we're all going to need the support of our neighbors. And that's, I think, sort of best gotten to uh, through empathy and through service. Um, two is some amount of career exploration or an internship. If the idea is to try before you buy, I think one of the greatest value propositions for a gap year is that, that if you decide as a result of your gap year what your career is, you'll have greater clarity as to whether or not a college degree is necessary for that given course, in which case go get to the college degree and get through it faster as all of the data shows for gap years. Um, but if not, then heck, take the time off, get, you know, get focused on what your career is through your gap, gap year, gap time, and then go towards a career technical education, get focused on, on a, an apprenticeship or some sort of skilled trade. Three is some amount of paid work. I like to focus on that because it's a way of saying like, like it's accessible. You don't have to have a lot of money to do a gap year and it's always better for outcomes if students reap a little bit of what they sow. In essence, if they work, they invest, they're gonna get more out of the experiences. And then finally, I like to say a bit of a free radical because if part of the idea of it is a gap year is that you can go out and, and maybe this thing that you love doing could be the thing that you're paid to do well then, then why wouldn't you allow some space to experiment with it, to kick the tires on that, that experience, that profession? So fundamentally, it's a caution to not be overly sort of intended in, in, in sort of um, um, scripting or scheduling your time. Um, um, another way that I find is helpful to think about it is as a fall, holidays, winter, spring, and then summer, thinking about it in those normal academic processes. So fall tends to be maybe more structured Holidays, come back, do some college applications, potentially um, um, lift your head to the changes that you've made in yourself and see them better. And then in the winter or the spring, you might go off and do something more independent. Um, that's a good way to save on costs is if you can focus more on the independent experiences and less on the structured, the programmatic, the leadership, the, all of that high cost overhead stuff that can oftentimes save a family a lot of expenses. Um, we do have some data. I'm not going to get too far into it. If they come up in discussion, I'm happy to, to point to it. GPAs are over improved um, of students who take a gap year. This has been corroborated by multiple studies. Um, um, in this particular case, almost 0 0.4, 0 0.45 improvement to GPA for students who have taken a gap year. Um, and this is through a self-reported impact study. And some of the things that I like to hype on this one are 77% um, of youth have expressed that it helped me find purpose in my life. Another 77% said it will or has impacted my career decision. And for all the parents on the call, 75% um, says it helped or will help me get a job. Um, um, and then for the, for the sources, um, 
um, uh, just because Steve was asking for them. Um, the first one was done by uh, Bob Claggett. Um, he's a former Dean of Admissions for Middlebury, um, currently works uh, at Colorado College, uh, chairing the Gap Year Research Consortium, a, an amalgam of different colleges trying to really boost the research effort on Gap Year outcomes. Um, and then this one, the self-reported Gap Year Impacts, came from a 2015 National Alumni Survey that we're actually rebooting to be a 2020 National Alumni Survey. We got such good results from that, we're, we're doing it again. <laughs> Um, some of the financial impacts, I think gap years can cost a lot of money or a little bit of money, or you can even get paid to do a gap year. Um, there are so many different ways to do this. I, I do like to emphasize that there are gap year consultants. Um, there's also uh, independent gap time where, where students cobble together their own network of family and friends and their own sort of initiatives for work to, to build out a full year that's just fully orchestrated by them. Those have great outco outcomes. Um, accredited programs, those can cost as much as $55,000 for a year or as little as $750. And those have some structure that's something that GYA does to address the question of what are the good ones, is it safe, um, um, sort of what are the pedagogical tools. And they always like to emphasize service year or AmeriCorps in particular. There's a variety of channels that are out there for youth to do AmeriCorps that's more of a domestic gap year experience, which we strongly back because you can have a great experience domestically as well. And those cover your cost of living. They're highly structured, great outcomes, and also you award you with a Siegel Award, which is actually now even more than the $5,700 shown in the slide. It's closer to $6,000 that can go towards an educational award. And again, those are phenomenal outcomes and phenomenal experiences. Um, final slide is around college advice. We still recommend generally that the best plan is to apply to college, get accepted, and then defer. And what we're finding is that in most of the cases, roughly around, it's only around 12% of, of young adults who apply to school, get accepted, and then defer, choose a different college, which frankly, I expect it to be a higher number. But on one front, I'm happy because it means that that path that they initially chose remains still significant for them to pursue a college degree. Um, and I can talk about other data. I'm happy to, to, to fill your, your, your brain waves with all that good stuff, but I also don't want to dominate the conversation. So um, respectfully, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of book in my part of the presentation and pass the, the baton. Awesome. And you may have to stop screen sharing for Stephanie to be able to start. There you go. All right. Thanks so much, Ethan. Um, let me see. So it's just this button at the bottom, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Wong, and I am currently halfway through a year-long learning sabbatical um, to explore the future of education and whole character development. So I realize that most people here probably are more interested in gap years for students, so typically between high school and university or just after. Um, so I've tried to concentrate more on the process that I took to explore um, different forms. Of, um, of gap years that I took a look at, um, as well as see how this might be a tool that a student can consider um, taking at various points in their life, um, even after school. So I hope there are aspects here that um, may also be helpful for teachers who are looking to guide their students through certain transition points in their life. So a little bit of context, um, about two years ago, I was stuck. I was working at an insurance company in Hong Kong, um, focusing on talent management and learning and development. Um, mainly for adults, and I had a great team, a lot of opportunities to grow and autonomy, but there was still something missing. And so my awareness of the options that I had at that point were you either get a new job, um, you go do a master's, or you um, just you know, happen to strike rich and you try to travel the world. And so at the same time, I yearned to return to my interest um, in the future of education and, you know, believed in this responsibility of education to not just equip students with cognitive skills um, that they need for the future, but also to hold space for these young people as they explore their own depths and create meaning in their lives. So I also knew that I desired something that was going to be a balance between um, theory and action. And I wanted to ultimately see how the skills that I had developed for the past like six, seven years in the workforce could perhaps fill a crack in the Hong Kong education system. Um, I am from Hong Kong, based in Hong Kong. This is where I want to live and um, want to be able to help the young people here thrive. 
So I started hearing about friends who had done things that weren't quite those three options I had listed earlier. Some took three months to go to conferences and meet with people. Another person that I met um, had spent nine months essentially learning about poverty and doing a combination of both travel as well as interviewing people in social enterprises. And the great thing was that all of these were cheaper than doing a master's program. And so the idea that I could design a sabbatical um, and intentional learning journey for the purpose of creating what I wanted to do next um, really intrigued me. So I started building this out. Um, and I think uh, some, of the, it, some of the aspects that I touch upon um, also overlap with Ethan's. So I looked at a lot of master's programs in education and I found out what they had in common. Um, there was always a required course around general learning theory. There was always something around globalization in education. And so I drew from a lot of online courses and in-person workshops and books and papers and articles. Um, so one of the first things I did was I tried to build out the content and conversations piece. So in addition to going online and looking for the material there, um, I also yeah, sent emails to professors asking for their required readings and courses that I found interesting, uh, grouped them together by topic, and also started making a list of um, people that I wanted to meet and organizations that I felt were doing really exciting things. So what that ultimately turned into um, as I was processing everything was that I decided I wanted to spend the first six months like really immersing myself into um, these learning theories and about education and the modules that I found interesting. So the seven modules um, that you see listed here below are around the purposes of education, around equity, around care and character, creativity, different systems of thinking, and then more of a deep dive into Hong Kong's education system um, and uh, where, where the gaps are there. <clears throat> so I had spilled this all out. And then underneath this, I also, um, for each of these modules, I had learning goals. Um, I had the different kinds of materials or people or organizations, as well as um, certain deliverables in order to help embed the learning. And so once I created that, then I sent it back to these professors and I said, these are the things that I'm interested in. Uh, who am I missing? Like, who do you think is critical that I read or know about? And so um, people tended to be quite open to that, um, both professors as well as research scholars and other people that I encountered. And then so the second part really was around um, sort of like reflection and support. And so I really thought back to my times um, in high school and in college, and I wondered to myself, like, how did I really learn, right? Like, how did I create those sort of like felt sense experiences that I was gaining, you know, a deeper level into, um, into, a, into a certain topic? And so um, did that mean that I needed to assign myself papers? And I realized that I learn a lot through discussion and reflection and writing. So I set up a website and started um, writing blog posts across different categories. One of them was around perhaps like um, understanding like new ideas and how that made sense for what I was learning so far. Another one was around, um, you can see over there, like half-baked ideas. So things that sort of occurred to me that I might want to test out in Hong Kong and then just Creating that and having a space for myself to, um, to design that, I think, was very helpful. Um, other things that also helped me with my reflection was um, finding partners to read books or take online courses with. Um, I think it helped me a lot to be able to have these sort of like mini discussion groups um, or, for example, to gather a couple of people and say, today I'm going to tell you about like what I've learned for the past month. Um, and that kind of uh, process of synthesis and reflection really, really helped a lot. The support part also was quite critical. Um, so over here I have um, the Leap Year Project. And um, for those who haven't heard of it before, so this was put together by somebody named um, Victor Saad. And in 2012, he made the decision to um, leap his current job and engage in essentially 12 internships over the course of a year. And so through this, um, he was blogging about it, reflecting on it, ultimately published a book about it and created um, something called the Experience Institute that helps um, recent graduates from college uh, look at a combination of sort of like real work learning as well as online and in-person courses to help them sort of build out what their futures might be able to look like. So I had reached out to him um, earlier in the year and so he uh, put me in touch with four other people who were also doing their sabbaticals at the same time. And then so 
uh, ever since about like March or um, April of this year, we've um, had monthly calls. And so that has gone a very long way in just being able to, um, you know, feel, feel not so alone, I think, in this endeavor, which sometimes happens. Um, another thing that um, I did was be really um, intentional with meeting with mentors. And now that I've completed the first six months of the reading, writing, reflecting, um, now it's I'm moving more into this idea of experimenting with things and iterating on the ideas that I had come across over the past six months. And so over the course of um, my travels and my interactions with people, there have been many who might not uh, want to sort of take on the mantle of being a full mentor, but um, they are very interested in being um, like kind of a sounding board. And so I sort of called them here idea sparrers. And they, um, and so they're people that I look forward to kind of like connecting with um, every time I have something that I want to um, speak with, speak to them about. So, in short, um, I started this in uh, this sabbatical in April of this year, um, and I started it with um, a walk uh, across Spain, and I did the Camino de Santiago, which took about um, 30 or so days, and that was a really helpful marker, I think, for me to just think about the life that I had before and what I wanted to create now going forward. Um, and then so from there, I've spent the past few months um, going to different kinds of countries where interesting things are happening, um, as well as working through the curriculum that I have. So I'll just stop there um, and happy to take um, any questions. Thanks. Okay, that was so fascinating. Both of you, <laughs> that was super interesting. Okay, so Stephanie, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question and, I'm, and I ask this genuinely. Mm -hmm. So what you've exemplified in your own learning sabbatical, the kind of agency, the making connections, uh, it's almost sort of an entrepreneurial approach to education, is so different than top-down structured education, right? And so it feels like there's a dilemma here. And the dilemma is, and you're thinking about the future of education and structured formal education, you've taken a very non-structured approach. So I, I, I've looked at science fiction and seen this reflected as well. Like, so we have movies about the future in which information is dumped into a student's head or they get into a pod and, you know, it's the matrix download. And the other vision of education is a very Socratic kind of helping create the capacity of the individual knowing that they're then going to have to make decisions that will be important. So I, I'm seeing what you're doing as being the latter, the, the creation of an independent thinking on your own part. And is that possible within sort of mandatory public schooling, which really ultimately comes down to kind of job training and enculturation and conformity? Yeah, I mean, um the thing that occurred to me, I think, especially in the um, in, in the beginning parts of it was that I was thankful for sort of like the education I received and the and the intense structure of it, because it also allowed me to access just different ways of um, being able to think and to learn. And so when I thought back to what makes me learn the best, I was able to draw upon those kinds of experiences. Um, at the same time, I think that to, to what you were saying about trying to find that balance, I think it really is different for, for each person. And for me, I definitely have moments where I might have spent 12 hours, say, last week reading a book, and then I sit with myself, right, on Sunday, and I think, well, um, that was great, but, like, what was the point of it, or, like, what can I do with that information going forward, which is, I think, where the doing aspect um, really helps bring that in for me. And so for me, it really has been a case of like reflecting a lot on sort of what, um, how I learn best, um, what were the structures or shapes or the people or the environments that allowed for that to happen, and then to kind of experiment with those and create situations for myself where I can do that. And it's just a constant iterative process. Um, and I think throughout the past six months, it's um, definitely been something that uh, I've, I've tweaked going along the way. Okay, lovely. Ethan, I'm sure you have comments. 
um, uh, uh, just in general about, um, like, give me a little bit more of a lead than that, Steve. Oh, no, 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 no. So, okay, so Stephanie's obviously a little bit older. Mm -hmm. She really, for me, has gotten to the core of kind of the, the, the highest level of individual self-direction in regard to learning. It's, it's, you know, if I'm sort of thinking about my own children and sort of what I hope for them, that's what Stephanie does. And it's very much what I've done, right? So Stephanie, I did a 400 interview series on the future of education, right? And I actually just called famous authors and I talked to them and I was like, this is how I work. Mm -hmm. And so I see the process of education taking us from kind of schooling to maybe training, which would be a higher level of memorization, but for a specific job purpose to education, which is where somebody mentors you and helps you, to self-directed learning, where you're really sort of figuring things out and you create your own map and your own plan. And I would love to have some way of helping students build the kind of plan that you've built, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately, you want them to feel, I personally want them to feel that level of capacity. And it's also a generational thing. I sort of feel like if you really want to help the next generation, you help them develop that capacity so, Ethan, I guess I'm, I'm interested just in your thoughts on that, but also, you know, uh, Stephanie's shown a very interesting way of doing a, a learning sabbatical or a gap year, and how does that map with the th kinds of things you think about and the kinds of services you offer? Well, it's, it's, um, um, that's helpful, um, as we say, for walking the circle. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, generally speaking, um, um, Stephanie's done a, a phenomenal job in, in really focusing on on her particular okay so it's funny we talk about leadership as a great quotient right we talk about sort of you know leaders get all of the the accolades in our society um but any leader who doesn't lead from a place of sort of authentic self is inevitably sort of wearing a mask um, another way that i could say the same thing is uh, the vast majority of, of adults out there in in at least in the states it's been my experience um, um, are, are busy living someone else's definition of success without ever having taken the time to figure out what success looks like for themselves. And so, so the, the question that I like to throw back to students is, is, is it even possible to live someone else's definition of success successfully? And, and my answer quite clearly is no. It's their definition of success. How could you possibly live their success yourself? But then I ask the harder question of, of what does success look like for you? And the reality is that, that humans, everything that I know about humanity says quite clearly that that's not going to be done in a classroom. It's not going to be done in a textbook. It needs to be done in the real world. We're experiential learners at our core. Before there was writing, before there was literature, we were literally running around stuff, hitting it, saying, does that hurt? Does that feel good? Does that taste good? Am I feeling sick now? Like, like humanity has always learned that way. And so I think it's really important for us to understand that, that we as, as contributors in society have, have, have a dimensionality to ourselves with a lot to offer the world. But until we take the time to figure out what our unique expression is and what the world's unique needs are to better pair them up, inevitably I think we're gonna be missing the question around what purpose is. And I think if we're going to live a life of success, you have to have some sort of purpose quotient. Don't worry, I'm not going to create a new PQ or an IQ or an EQ, but we got to have some expression for, for who we are in the world, how we want to see each other in the world, and where that's taking us. And what I think Stephanie did a great job in doing, there's, there's a guy who did um, something called 50-week job, and he did something like, just like what you were talking about, Steve, where, where for, for 50 weeks, he took a job a week, and he experimented with it. And, and what he came back ultimately, he ended up doing a TED talk and he's written a bunch of books and um, he had dreadlocks then, he shaved them off now. I think he's on his third child at this point. Um, um, but it was, it was so foundational for him to understand what it is that he likes to do, because how do you know if you're gonna like it until you've tried it? Um, and, then, and then what kind of expression that takes in the material world, right? We have to get paid for our work. Hopefully it has purpose. Hopefully it satisfies us and hopefully it's something that the world needs. Um, um, and so maybe one, one example that I always like to sort of round this whole conversation out with is, is imagine a young person who's going off to college, right? They're, they've completed um, uh, 12 years of education. Um, incidentally, uh, the number one reason listed in our data that's been corroborated by three different sources for students taking a gap year is burnout from the competitive pressures of getting into college. So students are approaching the gap year primarily out of the directive. I'm tired. This has been a lot to get to this point. 
and I'm starting to not feel a great degree of like personal animas to go forward with this thing that's in front of me. So imagine a young person going from their, their, their senior in high school to college, their freshman year, they're taking the gen ed requirements and they're going in quite clear, right? Marine biology, I always hope harp on marine biology because um, it's something that I hear quite a lot from young people. So you go through your freshman year and your freshman year, you're paying a lot of money in, in higher education, especially in the States. Um, your grades may or may not be good, um, um, but your freshman year, you're going through all the prerequisites. Maybe your sophomore year, you're starting to do some of the higher level classes, but really it's not until your junior year that you're actually doing an internship. So, so you've gone through two, maybe two and a half years of undergraduate degree before you finally really understand first person what it is to be a marine biologist. And inevitably some walls come crashing down. Primarily, you think that you're primarily gonna be working in the ocean, you know, saving wildlife and, and helping um, various species. And what 95%, maybe 90% of being a marine biologist actually is, is writing grants and in a lab. But if you haven't figured that out, come your junior year and you go back to changing a major, that's a large part of why so many young Americans take six, six and a half years on average to graduate from college is because they're changing their majors so many times as opposed to taking some, in, some, in, some, some intentional time, we really sort of wrap the word around that, intentional time, to, to experiment with what, what this thing could be a career out there for you, and what the expression is that that could look like for you in particular, and then get to, get to your career in technical education or get, to, get through your degree much more quickly. And happily, our data is showing the median time to graduation from, um, from college with a bachelor's degree is 3.75 years if you've taken a gap year. The average year, or the average time is four years. Uh, per the slide I showed earlier, the GPA is improved. Leadership quotients show up. Um, um, uh, higher orders of employability. It starts to hit all of the metrics that not only colleges are thirsty for, but, but to your question to open us up, Steve, the, that idea that are we actually preparing young adults for the working world? or are we actually preparing them for an academic world? And I think a lot of people would agree that young people who are graduating with a bachelor's degree aren't necessarily that, that prepared for the academic or for the real world, the sort of the job world. Um, um, and not surprisingly, I think why you're seeing so many young adults say, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll roll the dice to be an entrepreneur and do a startup, right? I see that a lot from young people. And, and the reason why they're doing that, I think is it's, it's really logical. They're looking out and they're saying, gosh, you know, for the investment of time, stress, if I hit this and it knocks out of the park, I'm good for life. But if I don't, the learning that I'm going to get from this endeavor is going to be so much more valuable than a year or two of college classes that, yeah, I'll go back to college after this endeavor, this initiative, but I'm going to learn so much in real world terms that that's such a compelling thing that they do it. Ethan, it's so interesting that you kind of finished with that description because I spend a lot of time talking to young single adults and I rarely hear that level of go at itness or yeah. attitude. What I hear most is I just don't know what I'm doing. I work three gig jobs. I, you know, my education was a waste. I've got student loan debt. I don't see a path forward. I mean, it may just be the community I'm in, which tends to be a fairly progressive community. So it's, it's kids who are more artsy <clears throat> than rather than career track. But it still feels like in a really interesting way, we did not do, my generation did not do a good job of creating the conditions for them to under, understand how to succeed, nor did we create the conditions for success. And, and this, I'll spend 30 more seconds on this. This came up in the first gap year session today, which is, in a lot of ways, the adults in this world have created a world that doesn't make sense, right? You can't keep printing money. You, you, know, you can't lie about research studies for decades and, and then have people trust you, right? I mean, you can't pretend that, you know, after the Harvard thing came out about studies and, and, the, and the money, I mean, that, that's the tobacco story of their generation, but it's not nearly as big. But I don't blame them for not trusting the banks. I don't blame them for not trusting the pharmaceutical industries. I don't blame them for saying what, I don't see a purpose or a path here. So I think in a really interesting way, we've left them with a really crummy circumstance. And I guess my hope is that, you know, encouraging a gap year encourages them to actually kind of find a path in life that makes sense. Yeah. 
Let's see one one other thing that I'll I'll add to that because that was well said is I think I think the elephant in the room for young adults right now it, it's climate change. Um, um, what's the point in a career if there's no planet to sustain us? And and we've done a great job of bottling up all of those challenges for young people that that are, are that they fully sort of feel the mantle of, and yet we haven't done a great job of passing the baton to them. So, so, so I think one of the things that, that, that most powerfully a gap year can do is, is connect the person to, to the world that's around them, right? In a real visceral, human, sort of like, like tangible sort of way, again, in that experiential realm, because that's ultimately what's going to give them to get, it, get them to care about the things that are, that are around them. They're, they're, it's, it's kind of interesting because on some level, I, I'm beginning to hear a sense like some, I don't know if it's a sense, but but some, some nihilism is the term that's coming up for some youth right now. What's the point? I just don't see the point. And, and, and I think until we can connect them to a sense of hope, a future where they see themselves happy with neighbors, like, like pushing like great initiatives, until we are able to, to support them into that vision, that expression, um, I, I think we are sort of dropping the ball. Yeah. So interesting. Okay, so Stephanie, I don't know if you have any comments. I do want to ask you about the, the, the 30 days in Spain, because I can't imagine that was without danger, meaning you sort of had to knowingly say, I'm going to do something that, that other people might say, well, why would you do that? That's dangerous. And there is an element, Ethan and Stephanie, to a gap year. Our daughter, our second daughter took a gap year in Nepal. And I, and I told the story earlier today, I can remember getting a phone call from her. She was on a cell phone in a rural village. And she said, I'm, I'm sick. They want to give me an IV and I'm afraid I'm, I'm throwing up and I'm afraid I'm going to die. <laughs> and I, we, we kind of talked through options. We have the phone. She's like, we're like, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> right. But she is, you know, she's 19 years old. In most cultures, historically, she would be well into adulthood. She's capable of getting through something hard. But, you know, we didn't sleep well for a couple of days. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> so, Stephanie, tell us about that the trip. And when you finished that hike, what did you think differently about life? Yeah, um, it's just... it. I, I always love any excuse to talk about um, about the swap just because uh, right now in, in Hong Kong, um, it's like very far from my mind. <laughs> um, and so I think, um, it, well, first of all, to address um, your question around safety, um, one of the interesting things was I think with my um, parents and close friends, I did not want to um, be, be contacted at all. Um, but at the same time, had to figure out what, a way to be able to tell them that I was still alive. And so um, we basically like worked out the system where um, I had like, uh, I created a specific email um, because I felt very conscious about not wanting to receive a lot of output, you know, from, from the online world, um, where I would just like send these occasional emails um, that my parents and friends could expect um, just so that they knew that, you know, I was doing okay, that um, things, were, things were all right. And I had chosen this particular walk. Um, it had been on my mind for at least a decade. I had written a paper in college about it. Um, so always knew that I wanted to do it and also knew that a lot of um, women did this um, particular walk by themselves too and that most of the people on this walk um, were, were doing it alone. So I think that sort of like helped uh, calm things down, um, not just for myself but also for um, people who cared about me. Um, in terms of what happened after the walk, I think one of the really remarkable things was and the biggest difference as somebody who um, considers herself somebody who like is is fairly self-aware and is good at, you know, knowing how I might be feeling in any given moment and and justifying what that is. Um, I remember during the first week, uh, there were a lot of people who were reaching their epiphanies already, right? Like they would be walking through these forests and like bursting into tears. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, like I wonder when that's going to happen for me. And then also kind of getting angry that it wasn't. Um, and so one of the uh, interesting, that happen interesting things that happened, I think, about maybe two, two and a half weeks in was that you suddenly realize that when you're walking, you actually don't think consciously a lot, right? And that what you're doing instead, because I was also carrying my pack with me, 
um, is that you're thinking about your, your body a lot. You're thinking about what hurts. You're thinking about, you know, when you might be able to get into the next town. And that in itself was kind of an embodied meditation. So the fact that like no one single idea could ever stick in my head for too long before it like eventually exited. Um, and I think that was really critical when I came back um, to, to Hong Kong. Um, just knowing that, uh, that, that I wasn't, you know, my thoughts as they often say in meditation. Um, but then I think actually walking through that process and having that physical aspect of it um, made, made a huge difference. Yeah. So Veronica, we haven't heard from you at all. Did you want to comment? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been listening into the conversation here, but uh, I was thinking I'm not sure if, if I'm the right uh, platform because what I'm talking about is actually about the uh, pseudo gap years, if I may put it that way, because of my uh, own uh, experiences of uh, handling students uh, on foreign student exchange program and uh, two different foreign student exchange programs. So one which is a long-term one, where students come here to Malaysia for a one-year uh, exchange. And uh, the other one, which is uh, more of a project-based, where students uh, go online and get uh, to know each other and then working uh, together online because the technology nowadays is so powerful that uh, you can actually connect the world and not wait until school is over. Uh, school years are over, then you get into these uh, gap years and because uh, perhaps, uh, I, as I see, some of these people on gap years, and because uh, I, besides, uh, I'm in American Field Service, which I used to be a volunteer some time ago, and uh, there was actually students who were on gap years here, but they called it, they put them under AFS program as community service. But uh, I, I could see that uh, there were quite a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say challenges for them, because uh, they, as I see, they could have perhaps come from a background which was too uh, protected and too sheltered. And then uh, it was real sudden, uh, not only cultural shock in, the, in all aspects, it's like a, it, it finding a hard time to adapt to changes in a different environment, in a different culture, and everything all different altogether. So uh, if I may put it that way, in fact, in school here, even though here in Malaysia, um, it's a lot on the educators' uh, initiative uh, other than the government's, uh, what the government is doing in making public schools like uh, retraining teachers for 21st century learning, flipping the classroom, SDG and all these kind of things. We are actually at the ground zero level where uh, action, uh, I would say there's uh, all these action oriented kind of tasks has, uh, have to be uh, really be happening in public schools. But of course, it's also a, a challenge here because uh, from the transition period, it's not difficult to change people's mindset. Of course, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I always believe in uh, blending theory with practice. So uh, from my own experience, these are all very real experience of handling students, of handling even sometimes uh, out of my area of dealing with foreign exchange students. And because some of these uh, AFS, American Field Service, uh, uh, I would say the, the people who come here, the, the candidates who come here, and these uh, NGOs, and they are actually uh, be here, I would say that there's a different kind of a gap year. A gap year. Uh, they actually uh, work with the NGOs here, and uh, a, a lot of, uh, I, I can see a lot of them just uh, actually have to go through different kind of uh, uh, challenges and problems here. So my own experience, okay, my own experience is uh, in 2005, uh, I actually had to, uh, my, my students and uh, actually was, uh, we're working on this uh, project with Taiwan under the IN6 uh, Asian Student Exchange Program, okay? But this is all actually, I would say this is a pseudo gap years, is sort of like uh, maybe preparing them for, if they eventually take up uh, in, uh, uh, officially in what you call a gap year, then uh, they will be more prepared. Because at a young age of like the 14 years old, uh, my, own, my own students here, uh, after a three, it was a three month uh, project based kind of exchange. So uh, the initial stage is that they have to work, go online and work on projects and share a lot of ideas with each other uh, online. But at that time, 2005 in Malaysia here, I'm not sure about other parts of the world, the uh, connection here was really poor and then uh, facilities like Skype or this wasn't really working well. But because Taiwan uh, has their own uh, 
well, I think I, I can't really remember the name, but they, they have their own connection. Uh, I, I think it's some sort of ISDN connection, and then we they we shared their connection with us, and that's how uh, things were done. Uh, we're using technology and where they actually the walls of the classroom are being broken down and then eventually it was really ex, uh, exciting uh, for students and uh, even students from other schools they they were given uh, the finale was they they have uh, they were given a chance to go to uh, taiwan Kaohsiung, taiwan to uh, present uh, their project uh, with their uh, co-partners and uh, to to all those uh, participating schools from uh, asia Okay, so when they were in Taiwan, they get to stay with host families and they get to uh, do other things like, uh, like what these foreign exchange students will get to do when they are with their host families here. All right, that was in 2005. Okay, that was actually, is like, uh, you have to put action, uh, into action a lot of things. Of course, uh, uh, theory, it might look uh, very nice things are being put forth in such a way, but uh, is, the, is the actually the practical part of it where you have actually have to deal with uh, uh, the, the students, the host families and all this. I would call them, maybe you would call them support system. Yeah, it's a support system. I would call them the stakeholders, okay? The stakeholders uh, in all these exchange programs, you have the volunteers, you have the, the schools, you have the, uh, the host families and the communities and all these. Uh, uh, if this, all these are happening at the uh, school level, then when they eventually go to the gap years, I think they will encounter uh, uh, less problems or lesser problems. Okay, and coming to this uh, American field service, excuse me. Hey, Veronica. American field service program, I think uh, Steve, if I'm not mistaken, you were once also an AFS student, uh, but I do not know what your experience uh, was like. But as for me, as far as uh, for handling uh, uh, AFS students here, uh, those who were actually uh, put a place in, um, in my home city here of people, uh, they they actually put into schools, but then all of them, they have different expectations, like the host families, the students themselves, the schools, the communities. So when they have to be involved in such kind of, a, I would call it a learning adventure here, then uh, that's why some uh, some of these uh, stakeholders, they are really in a way I would say uh, lost because they do not know, uh, know what uh, what they are supposed to do and because everyone has uh, different expectations. But uh, I wish I will be. I, uh, there's one thing which I will be mentioning later on in my presentation. I think this evening, if I'm not mistaken, then is uh, I will actually be looking at the roadmap and uh, framework because we do not exist in a vacuum. So. Uh, because we do not ex 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 exist in a vacuum, that's why uh, we can have a lot of ideas in our head, but when actually put into action, that's when the, uh, the, the big challenge is, is how do you deal with this and all this. Actually turn, the future of learning is actually here now, so you will not find it a hard time here. But, uh, but of course, you get people who are more receptive or responsive, then things are easier. Like even right now in my room, I have some students with me here. Because I want to, them to know, like, they get an idea of what they they can be in for. And uh, I told them that uh, if I have a chance, I would try to arrange for them. Uh, because these are uh, 16 year old students, they are high school students, and they'll be leaving school next year after sitting for the public uh, exam. And that's where they can actually go on a, 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 a real kind of a gap here, if, it, if I may put it that way. I hope that's, this all makes sense to you. Okay, yeah, so you. that was super interesting. So. You've given us another phrase too. So, so Stephanie had a learning sabbatical, and you have a learning adventure. Uh, I really like those phrases. Um, and I was an AFS student, and I had a great experience. But you know, I lived with a host family, and you know, they were they had to be patient with me. I'm quite sure and I had to be patient with them. But that's part of the learning process. Um, okay, so where does this kind of leave us? If we wanted to take a couple of minutes here and say. What have we learned from talking about this? Are, are there ways in which it's valuable to communicate? I mean, I think, Stephanie, it's really interesting to watch your process as someone older. Ethan, it's really interesting to watch your process, you know, helping people to think about this and to do it. Let's maybe try to sort of sum up a little and say, you know, Ethan, what would you want to leave us with? Um, I, you know, it's funny. So, so great question, Stephen. I'm going to sort of um, keep it tight in my response because I think that's 
maybe the best way, which is I, I took off, um, I went my freshman year to college. The way I say it is I followed the herd to college. And I use that language, not because college was bad, but because I didn't have my own reason to be there. And so um, I left, I took off seven months. I traveled through India, Nepal and Tibet by myself, um, um, hiked the Annapurna circuit for three weeks, lived in a thatched hut during monsoon season, would not advise that by the way, volunteered in a soup kitchen, um, and then came back and worked at a local retail store for uh, the remaining five months to offset what I had spent. I ended up saving about $3,000 by the time I was done with my gap year. Now, here's what most of my friends said when I came back was, was, oh my gosh, that's great. I wish I could do that. And my response was always, you can. You have just as much flexibility and opportunity as I did, which wasn't much. I didn't come from an affluent family or sort of uh, sort of overly embracing of the idea. In fact, when I shared a mom, I want to take a gap here. It wasn't but a half a heartbeat later that she said, no, you're not. Um, and it took some time to convince her. But I guess that that's really the thing that I would, I would suggest to everybody. And that's to say that, that everyone stands to benefit from a gap year, um, an, an adventure sabbatical, whatever you might call it. I love that terminology. Um, um, but, but you, like, I think half of the, half of the, half of the benefit is had from the impulse to do it your own way. And, and whatever that is, I think I just want to see more people availing themselves of this educational tool because I see the value so profoundly. Lovely. Stephanie, thoughts? Yeah, um, it's, been, it's been great just like learning about um, the ways that this can be structured for students. Um, I think for me, my two biggest um, learning pieces, I think that I hadn't known as much um, going into it as I do now was, uh, first of all, really building in time for reflection. Um, whether that was like a week between modules um, to be able to really think about like what I had learned. And um, at the same time, like I had the security of having, you know, this curriculum that I could then send to professors and felt that that added like a little bit more legitimacy to my project. Um, but at the same time, some of like the most um, incredible experiences have happened when not necessarily when I'm just like sitting in a public library somewhere in the world, right, like reading these books, it's when the outside has somehow like found a way in, right. So it might be like suddenly stumbling upon like certain kinds of street protests or like participating in other um, activities that might be taking place and then seeing how that kind of mingles with what I've been reading um, and the theories that I've been consuming um, has ultimately, I think, created like just a much more exciting learning experience. Um, I bring up Hong Kong again just because um, at first when all the protests started happening, I wondered, like I felt, you know, an, um, an immense call to um, be a part of those and see how I could contribute and at the same time wondered, oh, would this be taking me away from the initial goals that I had for the sabbatical? And I figured out like very, um, very quickly that, that it didn't, right? And that those were things that have come together. And now it's very much a case of something that's very present and very urgent um, happening in our world, um, informing the things that I'm learning and also informing the things that I ultimately want to do. So I really echo what um, Ethan was saying earlier about um, just gap years and this isn't, um, maybe this isn't the language that you had used, but just gap years being um, an opportunity to really like reflect more deeply um, on where you're going and why and what you care about um, and why it matters. So yeah. Okay, so this is a great way to sort of kind of close. So uh, what's interesting about it is some of what you've described, and I think what Ethan's describing is the conscious act to get off of the treadmill. Right. And so there is a degree to which when you're off of the treadmill, you realize well, a lot of the things that other people think are important or that I used to think are important aren't actually that important to me. And it may be true that I don't go back onto the treadmill. Right. So it may be that it actually impacts my career because I choose, hey, I'm actually going to go help people, you know, in leprosy villages in India, because that's actually what I really want my legacy to be and not work for a finance company. So there's a really interesting way in which it may be that you, know, you have to be kind of honest about this, which is, you know, taking a gap year does potentially take you off of the beaten path. And it may be you decide not to stay off on the beaten, you know, maybe you decide to stay off the beaten path to do something that's non-conventional. 
Um, there is a level of addiction to sort of our current consumer culture where you'd say, okay, so yeah, there may be people who don't understand, but when I choose to do something different, it's because I see the world differently than, than, than the people around me see it. That was fun. That was, <laughs> I, I know I took off from where you were, Stephanie. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but there were thoughts that came to me. Okay, terrific. Anybody have anything final they want to say? This has been great, Steve. I appreciate it. Um, um, Veronica and Stephanie, it's been a pleasure to share the space with you. Thank you for the good work that you each are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say that if there's interest in, I don't know, like if you're curious about what the curriculum looks like, I'm happy to send it out to you. Um, so yeah, let me know. If you want to send it to me, I can post it with the recording of the session. Okay. Cool. So if you're comfortable with that. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sure it would be interesting. Okay. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you, thank you all. Take thank care. You. Bye. Thanks.